Finally, we should ask how is evolution relevant to this argument? Remember the key premise of the argument is that the probability of the eye having the structure on the assumption of intelligent design is much greater than the probability of the eye having that structure on the assumption of uh, evolution which is unguided. Um, well, Sober makes a couple of different points about this. One point is that uh, the theory of evolution raises the probability of this so that it's not very low. And that the probability of the eye having that structure on the, the thesis of unguided evolution uh, is not very low, then it's not going to be a lot lower than the probability of the eye having that structure on the thesis of intelligent design. That's one point. In more recent writings, he's also um, made another line of attack, which we can't talk about uh, too much, which is arguing that this probability is inscrutable. That is, it's something that we can't determine either way. If it's, if it's inscrutable, then we don't know that it's a very high probability, and so we're not going to know that it's a lot higher than the probability of this over here. Um, and this has to do with uh, assumptions that are made about what sort of designer we're talking about. Um, so that's an interesting uh, angle that we don't have time to pursue here, but if you want to read more about that, you can easily find material from Elliot Sober on the web and in various books and articles. We might ask ourselves, what did Darwin think about Paley's argument? Remember, he had read it and actually loved it. And, uh, well, was, was he convinced at the end of his life, though? Um, I've looked at a number of Darwin's letters about evolution and its relationship to monotheism, and his normal stance is that he's very reluctant to give an opinion. He basically says, look, I'm a scientist, not a philosopher, a theologian. Uh, I haven't looked into this much. Other people know more. Uh, also, he tends towards the view that the whole subject is just beyond human capacities. And especially if we're evolved from uh, comparatively stupid creatures like monkeys and whatever came before those, um, why should we think that the human brain is reliable on subjects like... Uh, the ultimate origin of things, or big metaphysical questions like naturalism and theism. Uh, but I'll show you now what I, the most specific quote I'm aware of. So usually he strikes an agnostic uh, tone, and he even says he's agnostic. He, he doesn't believe that there is a God or that there isn't. Um, but by the end of his life, I think he had taken a more atheistic view. And this is the most... Um, definite statement of his that I'm aware of. You can pause the video and read through this. So it's clear that he rejects Paley's argument. Um, what's not clear is exactly why. He says it has to do with the theory of natural selection. Arguably, he's assuming a very crude design argument here. He's rejecting an argument like this, that the bivalve shell has structure S. If the bivalve shell has structure S, and the bivalve was intentionally created. And then the conclusion will be that, therefore, the bivalve was intentionally created. Now, this is a valid argument. So there's no mistake in reasoning. And Darwin is saying, yeah, and I would reject the argument as unsound because premise two is false. The problem is that a sophisticated design argument proponent agrees that premise two is false. So very careful reasoners, people like Paley, or some of the people that Hume was criticizing in the 1700s, they don't make this argument. They agree that it doesn't follow Sorry, they, they agree that it's not impossible that living things have the structure they do and yet we're not designed. Maybe you've been out hiking uh, and you've seen when it's not obvious which way the trail is supposed to go and you'll find that some helpful soul has arranged rocks in a pattern like this right, to give you an arrow. Now, it is consistent to suppose 
it is possible that the rocks just happen to fall that way, right? Sure. And yet it seems the better explanation of that is that somebody wanted to signal to us that the trail goes this way and not the other way, right? So similarly, um, design argument proponents have always, almost always agreed that in principle, granted it might be a very remote possibility, uh, but in principle things could be the way just just the way that we view them and uh, that's just how matter happened to come together um, and there's no designer involved at any level they, they agree with that 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 is a possibility so they're not assuming something like premise 2 here um, another a couple interesting points here one point is Darwin was right. He was better at science than he was at philosophy. Uh, he wasn't trained in this kind of subject matter. And um, people assume that because he was a genius in science, he must be a genius in other fields and able to speak to these. I agree, I agree with the more reticent Darwin that he's not um, very careful in how he's thinking through these issues. Not to say he was a stupid man. He most definitely was not. And yet it seems to me that the reasons that he ceased to be a monotheist um, are philosophical and not scientific. So pause the video and read this quote here. So what's clear is that he is concerned about what philosophers call the problem of evil. And he thinks that the evil we observe in the world uh, is evidence against monotheism. And specifically, he's concerned with natural evil and with the problem of animal suffering. That is a problem, and it's an interesting problem, and it's one that monotheists should address, I think. Notice it's not uh, a matter of science, though. I mean, this wasn't something discovered by scientists, the fact of animal suffering. And uh, this just isn't within the subject matter of any science. So. Uh, as I understand it, he sees to be a monotheist really for philosophical reasons, not um, because of his discovery of natural selection and the development of species over time. Finally, I want to talk about uh, panda's thumb arguments. And uh, these have famously been offered by uh, famous scientists like Stephen Jay Gould. Uh, now deceased, but a longtime professor from, at a Harvard University. And the arguments go like this. Probably a designer would have made a part X in a certain way, call that way one, but the part X doesn't, doesn't have the structure W1, but rather a different structure W2. And uh, the conclusion is, therefore, probably this part X has no designer. Why do they call this a panda's thumb argument? Well, the panda has a very interesting thumb, and we put it in quotation marks because it's maybe not a proper thumb, like the thumb that you or I have. So notice he, ar he already has five digits, like a lot of other animals, including human beings. Um, in a carnivorous bear, there's a little tiny wrist bone right here. Um, right here. Uh, it's kind of an insignificant wrist bone. Um, now pandas, as they exist today, have this little projection coming out of their paw and they use this to scrape um, to scrape down bamboo uh, bamboo wood so that they can eat it. They use it to scrape the the outer surface off of bamboo shoots. Um, and so what we call a thumb isn't really a proper digit. Uh, notice it's just one bone. And it seems to have evolved just out of a wrist bone. So it seems to be a kind of funny, someone might say cobbled together uh, tool that a panda has. And surely no designer would have done that, right? They would have used their best design right away and not come up with this sort of half-baked um, 
you know, duct taped, uh, arbitrary pseudo thumb. Now, to me, the problem with these arguments is always, always the justification of one. I claim that no argument like this is cogent. What a designer would have done depends on what their total purposes are. So, exa uh, for example, suppose that you find a door propped open with a present. Um, so you've got a door that's propped open and it's being held by a present uh, and the present just barely holds it open. Uh, in fact, if you just touch the present ever so slightly, the door will slam closed. Now you might say, surely nobody intended that present to be a doorstop. That's, that's a crazy, stupid method of holding a door open. You should put something like a real doorstop there, or at least a really heavy object. Not a flimsy little present that just barely holds the door open. Surely that just got dropped there or something. But no, no, this is, this is going beyond what we should think, right? It depends what your purposes are. Maybe you wanted to surprise your girlfriend when she walks into the room, and so you decided to, you know, it's her birthday, so you decided to prop the door open with a present, even though it's not a very good doorstop. Given all of your purposes put together, which is not just the purpose of holding the door open, but also the purpose of surprising your girlfriend with a present, Given the sum total of your purposes, no, this is a perfectly good method to hold the door open. Um, suppose uh, you find that somebody has a fence to keep in their dog, but it's just a bunch of hedges that are trimmed sort of as a living fence. You might say, well, nobody intended that to hold the dog in. It's so inefficient. The dog can squeeze through or dig through somebody really wanted to keep a dog in, they would have put a chain link fence or a wooden fence or one of those underground invisible fences. Only if only a fool would uh, would uh, try to keep a dog in a yard with uh, some trimmed bushes. So surely that was never intended to keep the dog in. No, maybe it was. You, you can't conclude that at all, right? Maybe the person wanted to keep the dog in the yard, but they also wanted to have, oh, a very natural looking yard. They just, aesthetically, they don't like fences. Um, so given those two purposes, then, yeah, the fence makes a certain amount of sense. Um, now what about the panda? Is it obvious that no intelligent designer of the panda would would rig up a pseudo thumb out of a uh, out of a wrist bone? That depends. Maybe not if, if they're making pandas from scratch, but what if they're trying to make pandas out of pre-existing carnivorous bears? Hmm, well if that's what we were trying to do, uh, start with carnivorous bears and form a panda species, then yeah, they might uh, arrange things so that um, that wrist bone got a lot longer and then could be used for scraping bamboo shoots. Elliot Sober, actually, who I think is a really good philosopher, gives a version of this in terms of his likelihood principle. So T is the panda having this thumb. D is the thumb was intelligently designed. R is this thumb evolved without intelligent guidance. And Sober says the probability of T on R is a lot greater than the probability of T on D. Hence, this observation T strongly favors R over D. So he says, aha, there's a big problem here for belief in a creator. What we actually observe favors evolution over that. Now I think he's being a bit sloppy here. I think he's making a mistake. And that is not distinguishing intelligent design from the thesis of young earth creationism. Design here should mean just some intelligent designer he wrongly assumes that it must mean young earth creationism. Uh, this might be a problem for creationism as opposed to evolution, but it doesn't seem that it's a problem um, for intelligent design versus unguided evolution. So I would say this premise is false, understood in that light. The probability of uh, 
the panda having that sort of thumb on unguided evolution isn't a lot greater than the probability of uh, the panda having that sort of thumb on the hypothesis of a designer. That's not something we know. What are the designer's purposes? If the designer's purposes are to make panda species out of a pre-existing uh, carnivorous bear species, then they might just do things that way. So I think these arguments fail. I think they're commonly uh, overestimated as to their power. Okay, so some conclusions. Well, we haven't resolved this very interesting and arguably important question of monotheism versus naturalism. These are big issues, and evolution is surely relevant to it. Um, but other things probably will be relevant to it as well, comparing the explanatory of power of the two, taking into consideration religious experience and reports about miracles and so on. It's a big matter to really decide uh, on the comparative merits of monotheism versus naturalism, and we haven't been able to do that in this lecture, even in this class. Both sides, both the monotheists and the naturalists, need philosophical concepts and analysis here. Really smart naturalists like Sober recognize that, and to some extent Darwin recognized that as well. And um, my final lesson is that this whole issue is not to be thought of merely as a matter of science versus religion, or of science versus tradition, or science versus superstition. No, it's really more fundamentally a clash of these worldviews. And again, uh, evolution is relevant. Evolution, I think, is well established and does rule out young Earth creationism. Um, but whether it rules out monotheism is another thing. I don't think it does. Um, so, that's, I think, about as far as we can go. Design arguments are really interesting. Um, have they been completely undermined by evolution? Some think so and some think not. What you have to decide is what do you think? Probably you're a monotheist or a naturalist. Maybe you're confused. Um, and it seems like it's important to think through this issue.